Father God. Not of their diligence, the ministry, Father God. Hallelujah, Father God. All the activities that we have at the point, Father God. Hallelujah. We thank you that we're guided by the Holy Spirit, Father God. We thank you that revelation and knowledge and power come from you here at the point, Father God. The word is preached, dear God, here at the point, Father God, by our pastor, Father God. We thank you, Father God, that you open our ears, dear God. And that we receive knowledge and we increase in our knowledge of the Lord, Father God. Our Savior, dear God. Hallelujah, dear God. We thank you, dear God, that the light shines bright here at the point of the community. The church community with love and compassion and kindness, Father God. We thank you that we stand strong here at the point, Father God. We're firm here, God. We stand firm against the wiles and the schemes of the devil, Father God. We thank you, Father God. Lord, we ask that you bless this nation, Father God. We ask that you bless our president, the administration, Congress, the judicial branch of the government, Father God. We thank you that they look to you, Father God. We bless them in the arms of our prayer, Father God. Hallelujah, Father God. We thank you, dear God, that you bless the state. Hallelujah, the city and the local governments, Father God. All the official government offices, Father God. We thank you, Father God. That they will walk in wisdom, dear God. Hallelujah, Father God. God, we thank you that you bless our military, Father God. We ask that you bless their families, Father God. And God, that you somehow use them with your love and compassion to everybody they encounter, Father God. We thank you that you give them guidance and support of leaders, Father God. Challenges that can minister to every last one of them, Father God. Thank you, Father God. But we ask that you bless the missionaries and the missionaries, Father God. Thank you that you bless the Holy Spirit guides them in all that they do, Father God. Thank you that you open doors of opportunity for them to minister to people, Father God. Empower their witness and their word, Shepherd. Amen. I shall not want. Amen. 
He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters and he restores my soul. Leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Let's go to the Lord and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church today. Father, we thank you for not only supernatural understanding, but supernatural application of your word. Let us apply what you're giving us tonight so that we can be restored and refreshed with a touch from you today. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may uh, have your seats, but as you have your seats, look at somebody and say, good to see you tonight. Good to see you tonight. I'm looking at people on my left and my right. I'm also saying good to see you tonight. Uh, glad y'all came out. Good to see everybody on Facebook and uh, and YouTube, everybody that joined us this evening. Y'all know we want to talk a little bit more about part two. God wants to guide you into a preferred Future. God wants to guide you into a preferred future. One of the ways we started talking about it on last week, God, God is so good and his nature and his essence is good that we can trust him to guide us. Now, I want to talk tonight about part two, how God guides us and how God provides for us. We need to know how that is going to happen as we are guided into this preferred future. We have a God who is good and God will guide us right into where he wants us to be, the preferred future. But we, he needs our cooperation. Look at somebody say, he needs our cooperation. He needs our cooperation. Now, this is a psalm, Psalm 23. It was written by King David. He was a shepherd who became king. And, and it's, it, it's the, you know, he's the one who's writing the song. He gives us this, this insight into how God works in our life. David knows. David has some good times, some bad times. And one time David, uh, God gave David a choice. And he said, uh, he said, I can let your enemy punish you or I can punish you. He said, God, I'll fall into your hands. Because I know you love me. Don't let me fall into somebody else's. How many of y'all feel the same way? Don't let me fall into somebody else's hands. I'd rather fall into God's hands. David gives us some insight here on how God works in our life. So it's really a brilliant song. It's a powerful song. Y'all know it. Uh, probably everybody's memorized this song, right? If you haven't, then come on down here. We need to pray for you. Praise the Lord. Because we've been learning this one ever since we was, you know, knee-high to a grasshopper, right? So, the fact of the matter is that none of us know what the future holds. That's, that's what we have to come to the real, realization. We might think we do, but we don't. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. In fact, we could not have predicted what has happened over the last two and a half years. And the truth of the matter is, we don't know what's going to happen in the next six months either. Come on. But God does. Amen. See, you can look at the faithfulness of God in the past. I mean, all while we're in the middle of all these challenges, all of these obstacles, God was still building his church. God was still answering prayer. God was still delivering and saving people. God was still working in the lives of people. God was still doing great and powerful things. God was still doing things right in the middle of a pandemic. Every, everybody was, was, was losing their minds out there. God was still working. He's still in control no matter what people think. And to that respect, it's wrong of us really to get all worked up about the future when we know that God holds the future in his hand. We don't need to worry about it if we know him. Right? We have, we have a God and he knows who we are and he knows where we are. I, I need to let that marinate. He knows also, listen to this, what we need. Amen, amen. This, this song reminds us of that in a very powerful way. I call Psalm 23 really a song of confidence in our God. Amen. I'm going to tell you why I call it that. But, but we have to have confidence that God is, going, is guiding us and God is, is going to provide for us. So I want to just very quickly give you on this evening four things that our God provides for us. In order for us to get to this, remember, I keep calling it a preferred future. You're going to get to the future no matter what. Amen. Why not get to the one that God prefers? Amen. Amen. Why not get to the one that we that we want to have ourselves? We need to get to that one. <clears throat> and God has shown us right here in Scripture how it is 
that he guides us into this preferred future. Actually, this was kind of born out of what Jesus said. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and give you that life abundantly. Amen. But, but it's not, but every, I, it, it made a thing with me. I was like, man, I don't see it all the time. So, so if he can't even give it to me, why am I not seeing it? Do you see what I mean? I, I wasn't seeing it in some people's lives. Sometimes I didn't see it in my own life. Different things like that. So I wanted to know, you know, how is it that we're supposed to inherit everything that Jesus came to give us? If he died on the cross to give it to me, I want it. Amen. Amen. He died to give it to you. You ever heard somebody colloquially, you know, colloquialisms with, you know, I, I'm dying to do that. I don't like those types of words, but, but Jesus literally did. He died to give us this life. Amen. And so first of all, what you, what you need, if you're going to be ushered into this preferred future, understand first of all what God gives us is this, relationship. Amen. You and I are never alone. I don't care how you feel. You can choose to do life single. You can choose to live a single life. If you want to, you're still not alone. Amen. You can be in an unhappy marriage or happy marriage. You're still not alone. You may feel like nobody cares for you. You are still not alone. You could be in a family and still feel lonely, but you are not alone. You have a God. And as a part of what he gives us to guide us into this preferred future is he gives us a relationship with him. The Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd. Right? The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my... That, that's awesome that he would even consider us, but he's our shepherd. I, can, can you just say that? Real, say, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Can we say it all again? The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, I'm going to add one more phrase to that. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Go, go ahead and say that. I shall not want. I shall not want. Go ahead and say that again. I shall not want. I shall not want. Go ahead and say that again. I shall not want. I shall not want. So, so Pastor, what's the method to your madness? Why are you having us to just repeat this? Because I want this word to dwell richly in you. Amen. I want this to get galvanized to your spirit so that whenever you have satanic interference, satanic hindrance, you always understand, no matter what, you're never alone and you're never without. Amen. God has promised, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. But you've got to get that galvanized to your spirit. And one of the ways you get that galvanized to your spirit is you continue to confess it. Amen. Some people, be, some people choose to uh, uh, commit this to, me to memory. It's okay to commit it to memory, but confess that word. Why do I need to keep confessing the word? Because at some point, you got to get that out of your head and your heart. Amen. The head is not the ground that produces. The heart is the ground that produces things into your life. Luke 22, before Jesus gives Judas the bread, knowing that he's going to go betray him, the Bible says Satan entered him. It is talking about it entered into his heart. You're not going to do anything different than what's in your heart. You've got to believe in your heart before anything happens. The Amen. heart produces, not the head. 18 inches from your head to your heart, roughly, and it's a fight to get it there. All 18 inches of it is a fight. Because Satan knows once it hits your heart, and I'm not talking about your blood pump, I'm talking about your believing mechanism. Once it hits there, it produces. It out of your heart will flow the issues of life. Keep on sowing something from your head to your heart and you watch it show up. Amen. Whether it's good or bad. That, that's what happened. Judas didn't act until Satan entered him and got into his heart. He thought about it up until that point. Romans 10.10 10 says that it is with the heart that man believes. The mouth confesses, but it's with the heart that man believes. Amen. So when we hide it in our heart, it becomes real to us. It becomes strength to our bodies. It becomes encouragement to us. It becomes health to our bones. And you're going to need this word tonight. And I'm telling you right now, you're going to need it tomorrow and the next day. Amen. You're going to need it beyond the next day. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. And as we begin to look at this thing very closely, it's very, very interesting. I'm always asking you to read the scripture. Now, 
I copied this from something. So I put it up there. I put it up. Can you put the, can you put the, can, can you put, no, not that one. Can you put um, the New Living Translation? Can you actually copy it from what you have and put it up there? Because I want to show you something. I want to show you something. If you can do that, if it doesn't take too long. If it doesn't take too long. <clears throat> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk through it while he's putting the scripture up there. But you got to copy it. Not from, my, not from what I sent you, but from something else. That's my fault. I'm sorry. But it's very interesting as you look at the text. Who's got the Bible? Who's got a device? Tell me what, when, when it says the Lord is my shepherd, what are you seeing? Tell me what, tell me what you see in the word Lord. Tell me, how is it spelled? All capitalized. All capitalized. I wanted you to see that. All capitalized. The Lord is my shepherd. Go to Daniel uh, 9 and 19. Daniel 9 and 19. Can you do that tonight? Praise the Lord. Oh, Lord. Hear. Oh, Lord. For, so, the, so there's a difference between these two. They're both in the Old Testament. Both in the Old Testament. So there's a difference. Whatever it is, all caps, and whatever you have, lowercase included, there is a difference. So I'm trying to, whenever you're reading, look for those differences because it means something. Whenever it's written in all caps, it's not an error in the printing. It is not a mere inconsistency from the translator. When the, when the word Lord occurs in lowercase, the translator is indicating that that is the word, the Hebrew word for God, Adonai. It is in the Hebrew Bible. Adonai means sovereign one. It is not the name of God, though. Come on. It is God's title. Come on. Teach. It's God's title. So, so Daniel is said, Oh Lord, you're sovereign. Oh Lord, forgive. Listen, you're sovereign. Listen and act for your own sake. Do not delay. God, we know you're sovereign. Listen. Right now, he's talking about the title of God. But this is different in Psalm 23. Anytime you see it in all caps like that, it is the name Yahweh. Yahweh is, very, is, is, is a very significant name of God to Jewish people as well as anybody in the Middle East at that time. Uh, Yahweh is a sacred name of God. The name that God revealed himself to Moses with in, in the burning bush. You remember, this is an unspeakable name. This is an ineffable name. This is, it, it was written usually as those, those four letters that were up there. Can you put those letters back up? This is usually the way it was written. Look at somebody say, he's going somewhere. We're giving us all this background. He's going somewhere with this. I can tell him he's going somewhere with this. I mean, he ain't doing all this for nothing. He's got to be going somewhere with this. But he's just trying to give us an English language. Uh, uh, lesson right now. I don't think that's what he's trying to do. But but that YHWA, it was the, it was it was therefore referred to as the sacred tetragrammaton, which means the unspeakable four letters. Come on. The high priest would only utter the name of Yahweh once a year when he went into the holy of holies. This, this, this means something. When they wrote it down in the Old Testament, listen at this. Scribes would copy it. The, uh, the Essenes were a, uh, a monastic community. They would copy down the scripture. You probably heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. If you, ever, if you heard of it, it was, they, were, they were copied down or translated uh, in this place called uh, Qumran. And, and what they would do is these scribes, when they were writing they would get ready. They would write Adonai and keep on going. But every time they got ready to write Yahweh, they would go take a ceremonial bath. Every time they saw in the interpretation that they were talking about this name of Yahweh, they would take a ceremonial bath, come back, write it, go take a ceremonial bath again. So why did he put that about you? Come on. Teach. Why did he put it about? 
They were afraid. This was such a well-respected name. They were afraid that somehow they sinned on the way or, or, or sin coming back. So they went and took a ceremonial bath. They would put their writing instrument down, stop, and go clean themselves and purify themselves. Then they would come back and write, Yahweh. Now, they'd go back for another ceremonial bath. This was, this was a fearsome and a respected name. This was an awesome, this was a holy name of God. Moses said in Exodus 3, if I go into the land of Egypt and, and I talk to the Israelites, remember, he didn't grow up with them. So he said, I gotta go talk to these people. So who should I tell them sent me? He said, tell them I am sent you. They'll know, they'll know who you're talking about. Tell them I am. Tell them Yahweh sent you. That's what, that's what it means. I am Jesus. On several occasions, Jesus will say, I am this. I am that. He says, I am the bread of life. On seven, seven different occasions in the Gospel of John, Jesus said, I am this or I am. Now, what is he saying? He said, I am the Lord. I am this. I am ever present. In other words, whatever you're going through, Yahweh, the name of God, is feared and respected and, and, and sent some people to take a bath and call. He said, I am ever present with. That's what that means. The Lord ever present right here. The Lord is my. In other words, you don't have to look for him. He is your shepherd and leading you right now. He is right here in this place. He is here. But he's my shepherd and he's your shepherd at the same time. God is Yahweh. He is right here ever present help in the time of trouble. A very present help and overwhelming help. And why is it that we don't ask him? Come on. When he said, I am trying to show you just even with the written word, I'm trying to show you how much I'm there for you. Amen. <clears throat> He's the one right now watching over us. Yes, Hallelujah. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. In other words, he's there all the time. He's the eternal. Listen to this. Now. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah. Lord. he's the eternal. Now. In other words, whenever you meet your next issue, he's already there waiting Come on. and ready Lord. to handle it. Thank you, Lord. You didn't know you didn't know you were gonna get a bad report, but he did. He said, I'm eternal now. I am ready. Let's do this. It's constantly present. There's never a time he is absent. Which is to say he's there instantly and immediately. He's always there. He's always accessible. See, that's how we get ushered into this preferred future. Is that we always have our shepherd right there. Amen. Every day. Every hour, every minute, every moment, he is my shepherd. I have so much respect for the people in our child care facilities because, because you know, they're responsible for a room, but then they can have a child that needs to be cleaned up. And I have so much responsibility, uh, so much respect for them because, you know, they, just like sheep, are continually dependent upon the shepherd. I mean, a child can make a mess and they got to clean them up. But they're still responsible for that room. They're still keeping an eye out on every child in that room. Although they're dealing with one of them right now, they're still taking care of all the other ones in that room. And I really appreciate that gift in the same way. That's why I think it's so powerful and so beautiful. It is a powerful picture because the shepherd cares for many sheep all at once. Yet, these other sheep, these others individually and continually depend on the shepherd. Listen to this though, for all of their needs. When's the last time you've seen a sheep attack somebody, something and get something to eat? <laughs> sheep are totally dependent on the shepherd. Amen. And, and who are we likened to in scripture? Sheep. Yeah. Why is it that we want to run into stuff? Let me get off that. Come on. That's not in my notes. Well, when you think about it, sheep herding, you know, that was really the lowest occupation in the socioeconomic ladder at the time. I mean, 
A shepherd was about as low as you can go. Remember, they didn't even call David in. He was a shepherd. They didn't even call him in. They said, go watch the sheep. That's it. You're, you're, I mean, you know. Can, I mean, how great is our God? Come on. That, that he stoops to be a shepherd. Come on, teach. He is great. He is Yahweh. He is ever present. He is omniscient. He is omnipotent. But he stoops to be the lowest one in the socioeconomic ladder to lead us. Come on. That's what he likes. The Lord is my shepherd. He's the only one watching. He's the one that's watching over us. He's shepherding us. He's my shepherd. He's your shepherd. So you really, if you have somebody that is in the eternal now, then you don't have to worry about things. Amen. He cares for you personally. He cares for you intimately. He cares about you always and in all A-L-L -L ways. Come on, teach. teach. He cares about you. Let me say that again. I don't think they got it. Once to say that they got that. <laughs> he cares about you always. Amen. And in all A-L-L -L ways. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord. See, I don't need what you need tonight. Amen. But he's going to take care of your needs just like he'll take care of my needs. I, I don't know what you're going through tonight. I, I do know this, though. God is right there. He's right beside you. He's with you every step of the way. He's in the eternal now. Whenever you take the next step, he's eternal. And now he's right there. He's going to usher you right into eternity. But before that, y'all going to pass by a preferred future that he has outlined for you. Amen. And that is where he's trying to get you to go right now. So first, he guides you with this shepherding relationship. Secondly, what he does is he provides you resources. So I shall not want. Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So that means you'll never lack anything. You'll never need anything. Hmm. Teach. Hmm. Come on. Hmm. So you probably say, well, Pastor, I got some things I need right now. All I can tell you is God sees that you already have it. Come on. If you're following what he's asking you to do, he sees that you already have what you need. Oh, I wish I could go further with that. God knows. That's, that's why he calls us sheep and him the shepherd, because he knows sheep cannot take care of themselves. And in fact, if you leave sheep to themselves, they will run off the back. I mean, they will they will plunge through their own death. They will, they will not be able to do anything. That is why Jesus said in John 15 and 5, he says this, yes, I'm the vine, you are the branches. You got to remain in me, right? If you do, you'll produce much fruit. And then this is what he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Come on. Why? Because of the sheep. Amen. We're sheep. Apart from him, we cannot do anything. If you take a sheep, if you take sheep away from a shepherd, they wouldn't know what to do. I mean, just think about it. Think about it for a minute. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Here's the thing: the shepherd knows exactly what sheep need. See, our problem is we let other things determine what we need or want. He says, "I know exactly what you need. I'm the shepherd." And you really never want for anything because he said, I'm, if you'll just follow the way I'm leading you and guiding you, you'll never want for anything. See, he knows what you need and the time you need. Amen. Amen. Anybody ever had someone? Come on. <laughs> I'm going to leave that alone because y'all didn't get me. <laughs> Anybody ever had someone? Meaning you had it, but you weren't ready for it. Right? I'm going to tell you, around, uh, around this time, people got a whole new walk. I mean, they got a whole new walk around this time. Three months later, that same walk comes back. Because income tax check comes and everything, a whole new walk. Whole new walk. New kicks, new set. Sometimes you get things we're not ready for. Sometimes you think you're not ready for it. I would prepare. If I was about to get a lump sum, I would just prepare to take the first 30% and send it to a mutual fund. That's what I would do. <laughs> okay, I lost that by praise the Lord. You're trying to mess with the tax. I'm not trying to mess with the tax. You do anything you want with it. You had it one last year. Do you have it now? Can I tell y'all what I've been doing with my birthday money? 
Invest in it. Then one day, five years, I'm gonna tell y'all, you know, what y'all gave me and what it's worth now. Praise the Lord. That's the game I'm playing. I said, I don't spend none of it. I don't spend any of it, right? I'm just, I'm just saying, I always want to make sure that I have a plan for stuff so that I don't have to go with somebody else's plan for my stuff. Come on, teach. When a shepherd wakes up in the morning, what do you think he's thinking? Back then, what do you think he's thinking? For, he's thinking, what if I need to take him to Grady's? That was strategic in itself because they're living in the desert, pretty much in the desert, right? He's thinking, where am I going to take them to water them? They don't know how to find water. They don't know how to find grass, right? It's a desert area. It's not a bunch of streams and brooks and grass all over the place, trees and shade and all that, all that kind of stuff. So the shepherd has to be thinking, where am I going to get grass? Because it's not abundant. I mean, you know, he has to know the terrain. A shepherd has to know where there is water, where there is water now. Amen. Because there, there are times when, you remember Elijah had the book dry up? Where there's water, where there is water, where are the predators? Teach, teach. So he's a shepherd. He, he, he's got to know all of these things. So he has to prepare to lead sheep. Come on, teach. Come on. I want you to know today. God knows exactly what you need. He knows exactly what I need. He's our shepherd, right? He's been preparing a long time to meet our needs. He's been preparing to take care of us all along the way. I mean, just think about it. You have the, the, the most awesome being in all creation. And he's thinking about you. Amen. It's powerful. Do you know you're never going to come to God and say, you know, God, I have need of this. And he said, you know what? I'm sorry about that. That's in my mind. I ain't really know. I, mm, mm, I mean, I mean, he's going to say, I know exactly what you need and I'm prepared. I'm prepared to help. I'm right there. I'm the eternal man. I'm right there to help you. That is because he is a, he is our resource. He's, our, he's trying to guide us into this preferred future for ourselves. He does it first by giving us this relationship, whether we rely on it or not. I'm telling you, you're never alone, but you can choose not to ask. Amen. You're never alone. God, what would you have me do here? You can still choose not to ask him. You can still choose not to follow him because he's not going to force anybody to do it. So he gives us that relationship. Then he gives us a resource. Then third, mm, he provides rest for us. Amen, amen. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Come on. Then leads me beside the still water. So after providing the relationship, after providing the resource, I mean, this incredible God, he said, look at what I'm going to do next. If I'm going to get you to where I need to get you to, I'm going to then make sure you rest. Amen. He makes us to lie down in green. Now, as we read, you can't help but think about the Sabbath principle, right? You know, one day in seven, you stop and rest. And I know there are people like, my life is way too busy. I'll never be able to stop and rest in seven days. I mean, I got stuff to do. I got these kids. They got baseball. They got ballet. And then Lil Junior, he is he really is about to blow up because everybody's telling him he's a great star. And hold it. So I got to go to all of his games and all. I mean, I, and then I get behind and work. I got to catch up. So we won't rest. And God says, in order to get you to this preferred future, you got to rest. Amen. So sometimes you got to understand. I mean, I don't know if you see it. I know we memorize this so much that we, many times we don't see what's there. He makes me. Doesn't sound like a suggestion, does it? Doesn't sound like a suggestion, does it? He said, if I'm trying to get you somewhere, if I'm trying to get you somewhere, he said, he makes me. So that's a command. I don't, I don't care how you slice that one. That's a command. Can I just give you a little extra sugar for a down here? It is better. God never wants to teach us by harming us in any kind of way or making an example out of us. 
And also, I'm losing limbs up here. Uh, <laughs> I'm, 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 I think my arm went. I thought I was gonna freeze right there. <laughs> if I'm hot up here with these spotlights on, I, I mean, if I'm cold with these spotlights on, I know folks cold out there. Praise the Lord. Mr. Paul said, I want to make sure y'all don't stay up tonight. Ain't nobody going to Mr. Paul got control of the air. <laughs> so ain't nobody going to I see people with coats and scarves on, trying to write, hands falling on. Praise the Lord. But let me get back to my list. It's better. God said, I prefer to teach you by the word and by my spirit. He does not prefer to teach you by example. It's better that we learn this way. Rather than because, because he can make me. You ever had God make you like that? Just didn't want to just, just didn't want to, you just kept going. And all of a sudden my wife accused me of she goes, you go, 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 and then you just crash. Because I'll get up, I'll I'll have five hours of sleep. I'll go and start working again. I'll I'll be walking out me, all kinds of stuff. And she's like, you know. I, I said, look, don't worry. I, I'm, I'm and then one day I just sleep half to 12, 15 hours. I've been made to I've been made. Right? I don't, we don't always want to receive it that way. He makes you, he's a shepherd, so he knows what you need. He's preparing to take you somewhere. So he said, you need rest. So sometimes he just has to take his arm, put an arm around us, get close to us, and say, look, you need to lay down. You need to rest. I mean, y'all get into it all the time. How can I take you to the preferred future of a happy marriage if y'all, if there's, you know, if there's strife in the house? And the only reason that there's strife in the house is because you're glad because you're not sleeping. How can I take you to a preferred future? So if you're going to get rest, you need to pay attention right here. If you're ever going to actually rest, here's what needs to happen. You need to be free. Amen. Remember, what she, what does she need to be free? No sheep is going to sleep if a pack of lions is hanging out. Amen. If a pack of lions is hanging out, Ava, you have to be free of fear. You can't feel like somebody's always after you. If you're going to be free enough to lie down and sleep, sheep have to be free of friction. Mm -hmm. hmm. Can feel like somebody's always going to push you around, bully you. In a flock, that can happen. Somebody wants to be the big dog sheep. So, you can feel like you're being pushed around, but you can't rest in that atmosphere. Amen. You can't rest in strife. You can't rest in friction. Sheep have to be, in order to rest, you need to be free of, of that. You also have to be free of hunger. If he says, I give you the command that you must lie down and bring pastures, right? Wouldn't it be an unfair command if he would take care of my hunger? Because I can't sleep if I'm hungry. It would be unfair for him to command that. I want you to see that. Sheep have to be free of pests. All kind of stuff bothering them and stinging them. You ever seen a dragonfly, horsefly? You know, what do y'all call that? Dragonfly, horsefly. You ever seen a big horsefly? Right? That hurts. And many times they're on animals and they bite. So if God was not going to keep pests from me, I'm not talking about insects, I'm talking about pests. Come on, pests. He, he makes it a command to do this. It's an unfair command if he's not going to handle these things. So what he's telling you is I'm right here right now willing, waiting to handle this stuff so that I'm not giving you an unfair command. You keep on Inviting these flies. You keep leaving the door open for them to come in. That's a word for somebody. I'm going to move on, but that's a word for somebody. 
you can't lay down unless you are free. You can't you can't lay down when you're nervous, pacing, worrying, worrying, worrying about the kids, worrying about this, worrying about the root of that is in fear. So God said, I'm taking care of all that stuff for you because I've given you this command, and it's not unfair. I'm giving you a command to rest, right? Do you know what shepherds have to do sometimes? It's called collapsing the legs. Right? That means they trip the legs from under them very gently and cause sheep to lie down. Why do they do that? Because they're sheep. They don't know anything. The shepherd knows that of the food that they eat, they will never be able to digest it unless they're still and they're lying down. The sheep doesn't know that, so they'll keep walking. And so if they won't lie down on their own, the shepherd gently collapses their leg and makes them lie down. Because he needs their food to digest so that they don't have sickness and disease among them and get all the whole flock sick. See, he knows what the sheep needs. But the sheep is like, well, but I was walking around here and feeling good. But your food is not digesting. You can't see that. But still, I'm having fun walking around. All of this is a part of getting you somewhere. I hope you understand. God's not trying to just stop your fun. He's not trying to do anything. He's trying to tell you that many times a lack of sleep will cause things that you don't realize is coming. And what I'm trying to do is get you past a certain age. I'm trying to get you into a certain health. I'm trying to get you to this so you can be here to do my will. But you're not cooperating with me. Come on, teach. You're not cooperating with me. Um, I like Warren Buffett. I was listening to Warren Buffett talk not very long ago. He asked classroom kids. He said, what if? Now, Warren Buffett is second richest man. Still, I think, he's, I think he's second richest man or third richest man in the world. He used to be the richest man in the world. Right? So he's giving a talk to this class. And he said, what if I bought you your dream car? What if I bought you? I mean, when you leave here, and of course, they're, you know, they're getting excited. Because this guy, you know, if I told them I'm buying their dream car, they were like, yeah, whatever. Well, but if the second richest man in the world tells you I'm going to buy you your dream car, you go home and look for it. Do you see what I mean? He said, what if you got out of this meeting and you have it at the house right now? He said, but here's the catch. Only car you can ever have. He said, that what would you do? Would you garage it or leave it out? He said, that this is the only car you can ever own. He said, that's the only catch. It's the only car you can have on. He said, would you change the only man? Would you take care of it? Would you check everything? He said, do you realize your body is the only one you get? Your mind is the only one you get? Come on, teach, teach. You don't get nothing. He got heavy. He didn't get heavy, did he? <laughs> well, then I tell one of y'all ain't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let Warren Buffett know you <laughs> when I see him. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> if you know that your child is headed for unnecessary discomfort, would you intercede? Would you intercede? I mean, I would. I mean, if I know my child is making decisions that's going to lead to unnecessary discomfort, I'm going to. I'm going to collapse their legs and cause them to lie down. My question is this. Would you do that for your child and then are you a better shepherd than God? That's the question. Do you think you're a better shepherd than God? Do you think I'm a better shepherd than God? None of us are better than, none of us are better shepherd than God. Why is it when he tells us to do certain things, sometimes he has to collapse our legs to force to do it? Come on. I don't want him to have to collapse my legs for me to do it, right? I'm just, I'm just giving you something to think about. I want you to understand, this is how God is trying to get us to this preferred future that he has. It's a preferred future that he has for us, right? So, um, and sometimes we just, we just, have you ever known that something is bad for you? You just say, I don't do it. 
I know they're not going to tell you, but I'm going, come, come. We're going to have some fun Sunday. But we're going to get real Sunday, too, on relationships. Come on. You need to bring somebody in that. We're going to get real about some relationships. We're gonna get real, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about that right now, but we're going to get real about some relationships on Sunday. And we're going to have some hot dogs, and we're going to have some fun, and we're going to have some photo <laughs> booths, and we're going to have all that stuff. But we're going to get real about it. God wants you to have a happy marriage. God wants you to have a happy relationship. And there are certain things. You got handicapped a little bit because they ain't in the Bible. Come on. Out of marriage. <laughs> and folks say, go pick your mate based on who in the Bible. Okay, they ain't in You going to let me walk along with y'all on the date? I'm the dad. That's what dads did. He walked behind them. Let them talk in front of them and walk. And you going to let me go everywhere with you? That was the way they picked. We don't do that. So now we have to learn things based on the whole counsel of the Bible. How do we pick based on that? Go, go, go share that with somebody and tell them, you better, you better, you better. And we'll feed you a hot dog after. <laughs> but think about this one moment, right? I know you cried about it. I know you hurt over it. I know it's disappointing when things didn't work out your way, but was it a part of God collapsing? Come on. Teach. I know, I know, I know they let you go and you were hired before some I mean, some other people were hired after you, but they didn't let them go. Hmm. Can you, can you, in it? In a situation like that, can you still trust that God is leading you to a preferred future? I remember somebody had a situation like that. I told them, you're too big for the place. That's why, that's why you gotta go. Because you're too big for it. Now God is telling you to go be great. And I can say right now, the person that I'm talking about, I can't say their name, they're not at liberty to say their name, but they are much greater now. 15 years later, they've got a huge business, Traveling all over the place, they're doing everything they want, their little heart wants to do. They couldn't do that while they were in that position. And of course they were disappointed when they let them go out of that position. But I'm just trying to let them know, God, they want you to go be great now. You're too big for that. Please. Go be great. And they have done it. It's a blessing. It gives us the relationship, it gives us a resource, it gives us rest. And then finally, it gives us restoration. Amen. Bible said he restores my soul. I, if y'all give me five more minutes, I want to I want to teach you something because he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name. So it is it, God restores my soul. So restore means to bring something back to or renew it, bring it back to its original state or to a normal state, right? So you can really think of when you go back to that. Go back to the previous. Go back to the previous scripture. Uh, go back to two. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Then go to three. Then he restores my soul. There are many scholars that put the restoration of the soul. They they put that as more. So the stuff that precluded that sentence. Whereas many people, and I agree with them, had, it has more to do with what's after it than what's before. Come on. This Bible study. Amen. This Bible study. I mean, on Sunday, let me tell you what folks would have done on Sunday. I, they would be looking at me like, what in the world is he talking about? I can't go in this debt. On Sunday as much. But but I want you to I want you to see that. Leave me inside, restores my soul. So scholars feel, and, and like I said, I tend to agree with them, but it is better to see that he restores my soul. It's linked to what's after that. Look at what follows. He restores my soul. Listen at this. And leads me in the paths of righteousness. For his name's sake. So what happens is this. Is God has a right path. Amen. For each one of us. So this is what God does. Right path for you. You got right path for me. 
not necessarily the path that we want. Come on. It's not necessarily the path that we always choose, right? But it's like, God, I want to do this, but you want me to do that, you know. But understand something, God has the right path. It's a path of righteousness, it's a path of obedience. And if you are disobedient to the Lord, let me tell you, I mean, all of us are disobedient to some degree, but at whatever point you deviate from the right path, and you deviate from being obedient to him, you're not on the right path. And the, and the problem with not being on the right path is if you don't walk on the right path, you're going to miss out on the restoration of your soul. That's why we are in such problems. That's why worry happens. That's, there is no refreshing. There is, I never feel like you're refreshed or renewed. Always needing God to touch you some kind of way. Because really, that has more to do with being on the right path and not deviating from where God wants us, us to be. You know, they're, they're in, in Isaiah, it's, there's no rest for the wicked. Come on. There, I mean, no rest for the wicked. All right? I'm not calling righteous people wicked, but what I am saying, we can get wicked-ish. Come on. <laughs> we can get wicked-ish. That just looks straight ahead. It'll be all right. We can get wicked-ish. I mean, we can deviate and say, God just understands. Do you, see, do you see what I mean? We've got to be re very careful about it because there are no refreshing when we do that. If we stay on the right path, God says, I, I already know where I'm taking you. I've already outlined this path. Everything is on this path that you need, including refreshing, including renewal. You're never heavily burdened down. I'm going to read you something in just a moment, and it's going to it's going to show that I'm trying to. I'm not trying to make this message heavy or anything. All I'm saying is that there is value in doing what God is asking us to do. Amen. Part of the right path is spending time with the Lord. Amen. When I spend time with the Lord. Guess what happens? See, you just think, well, I'm not, you know, I have to get my minute or two in a prayer. But the truth of the matter is, prayer is on the right path. Come on. So whenever you pray, it is restoration to your soul. Amen. Teach. You got to remember that. Am I saying I gotta, you got to sit down there for an hour? I'm not saying you got to sit down there for an hour, but I'm saying you do have to do it. And there must be devoted time to it. Because you're just not there doing nothing. It is also restoration of the soul. When you uh, read the word of God, not like reading a novel. You can read a novel and there is no renewing in that. You got to understand, when you read scripture, it is a part of being on the right path. When you're reading scripture, you got to understand God is restoring you when you're doing it. Something supernatural is happening in your life when you do that. See, that's part of the right path for us. Get this. Get this. Hmm. Now, I like going on vacation. You, you never met nobody that likes going, you know, to be refreshed on vacation more than I do. But is the vacation necessarily on the path? I know church attendance is. Come on, teach. He said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves. Do it more as you see the end time coming. I, I have never stopped anybody. Is it, do you think we're closer to the end? Everybody, even non believers, tell you, yeah, I think we're close to God just coming. I said, God, do you, you said you didn't believe in God. Well, he's going to do something. I know we're close to the end time. That means you should be going to church more, right? If it's on the path, then you're not just sitting here in attendance. Something is happening to you, right? Amen. Come on, teach. Amen. Something kind of happened to people online. No, it's, it's, it's happening to you too, God bless you. Because you can't make it to service on site, but you can make it online. Praise the Lord. When you love your spouse, the way the Lord tells us to love our spouse, a godly love. Not get mad because it's almost about time of day, you know, some stuff like that. It's on the path. Think about it. It's on the path. So why is loving your spouse hard if it's on the path? 
Come on, speech. Why do you find it tough? Did you deviate in your choices? <laughs> they looked at me, me and that guy. It's on the path. So loving your spouse should be refreshing and renewing to you <coughs> rather than a burden to you. Now I'm not telling anybody to go get divorced. No, if you marry, you say marry. You know? Don't go tell anybody. Pastor Harris said, now if you ain't renewing and you ain't refreshing to me, I need to bounce you. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I said, loving your spouse the way that God wants you to love them is on the path. And anything that's on the path is supposed to be renewing and refreshing. So when I go into the right path, it restores my soul. So in other words, find a way to make that not burdensome. As we walk closer to the Lord, we will begin to know more about God's will for our, for our lives. I tell people when they don't know what God wants them to do, I say serve in church and watch what happens. Watch what happens. As you serve, and if you feel like you're in limbo, let me tell you something. The devil loves folks in limbo. He loves people to live Because he'll let you hear one thing and then he'll let you hear the complete opposite. He loves y'all. <laughs> he loves the folks in limbo. Because he can play havoc with them. He'll have you go to one church and they'll tell you to let go. And he'll go to another church. Hold on. Which one do you do? Which one do you do? And there's nothing with no one refreshing in that. That's what I'm trying to If it's on the path, that's what it should be. Now, I'm not talking about your personal will. I'm saying if it's what, if it's what God wants for you. Right? And, and that's what we need to really talk about. We need to attend to God's will for our lives. So as we seek God, you know, uh, we want to talk to God. Tell God, that, God, I want to live a life that is pleasing unto you. I want to be pleasing in every way possible. The way I talk to people, I want to please you. Right? The way I want to honor you in the way that I do business, no matter what, even if I lose, uh, you know, some of the things, I, I still want to come out of that interaction honoring you. I want to take advantage of anybody or anything. So whenever I don't do that, guess what I'm lacking? Whenever I'm not on the path, I'm lacking that restoration. I'm lacking that renewal. I'm lacking that refreshing. And, and you have to be very careful. There is value in walking close to the Lord. The closer you and I walk to the Lord in terms of being on the right path, the more we experience these two things. The recreative and restorative work of God in our lives. So it shouldn't surprise us. Look at what Jesus said. I'm almost done. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. He says, are you tired? Are you worn out? This is the message translation. Are you burned out on religion? In other words, I'm, I'm burned out on all these rules I got to, you know, all these rules I got to keep and uh, I'm just worn out on the whole church thing. You know, that kind, that kind of, if you feel that way, in the message about Jesus is saying, if you feel that way, come to me. Get away with me and listen to what the message version of the Bible says. Then you will recover your life. <coughs> I'll show you how to take a real rest. Come on. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn. Listen, listen, listen at what it said in the message about. Learn the unforced rhythms Come on. of grace. Everybody's life has a rhythm. I can't even get on this. But what, if y'all can find the message I did on what does your life sound like? Come on, teach. Everybody's life's got a sound. Everybody's life's got a rhythm. You got a rhythm and a sound to your life. And, and right here, it says you ought to have, Jesus said, with me you have unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. Praise the Lord. Listen at that. Hallelujah. Listen at that. 
Keep company with me. You'll learn how to live freely and lightly. Mm. So when you walk with him, go ahead and stand to your feet. You recover your life. We walk with him and our life is restored. He's not, he's not depleting you. If, this is, if it's on the path, it really should be refreshing. It should be renewed. I just want you to understand that whenever you're doing things like church attendance, whenever you're praying, whenever you're reading, whenever you're serving, you're not just doing that. There is something happening to your soul. Your soul is made up of what? You know, you've been here a long time. Huh? Your soul is made up of your mind, mind your will, your will and your emotions. So, so something should be happening right now to help you control emotions. Come on. Something should be happening right now to help you submit your will. Something should be happening right now to help you renew your mind. When you're reading the word of God, something should be helping you renew your mind. Submit your will more to God's will. And control your emotions. Because our emotions are fickle. They will go wherever they want to go. That's why we say we give a person a piece of our mind or, you know, don't say that again to me because I'm a clock. Right? I'm a clock. If you, if you say that again, it, it, it's going to be on. Then you probably need to be more on the path. <laughs> I would think. You know, somebody gonna get hurt tonight. If they, if they, if they, tell your spouse you need to be more on the path. Like the man said, praise the Lord. Then y'all be calling me. The pastor, I told him name. He got a name. Now I want you to understand. I didn't want this to be a heavy, heavy man. But what I want you to understand is we don't know what's coming down the pike. Which is why I went back to some basic, basic stuff to expose the text to you. And show you what God is saying to us. Even in a small word like Lord. Amen. He's trying to show you. Even if you get to a, a challenging economic time in this year. You don't want to leave him. He's right with you. Eternal now. Right with you. You have to always remember. Right when y'all are about to get at each other. If somebody would stop and acknowledge who's present, because he didn't go nowhere just because y'all want to fight. Come on. Right. Just because y'all want to argue. That, he didn't leave. Right. He didn't leave. Right. If somebody would acknowledge him right there, you'll squash that argument. Amen. That's right. That's right. That's good. But we can only do that if we have restored souls. Amen. If you don't have restored soul, refresh, renew, your mind ain't, your emotions would never be controlled, your mind would never be renewed, and your will would never be subjected to God's will. It takes these things on the path to do that, to continue. And you will be happy to do those things. It won't be a burden to you. Jesus said, I'm not putting anything on you that's a burden. We can make it one, but he said, I'm not putting anything on you this morning. Did y'all learn? Did y'all learn something that I give you? This is crazy. I'm just going to ask you for a moment. I'm going to ask you for a moment. Handle something by yourself just for a moment. Go ahead and play. I'm going to ask you to handle something for a moment. I'm just going to ask you to handle something. If you need another touch from God, if you're the one, I mean, just, just bow your head, close your eyes. Just deal with it right there. Father God, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that you're a good shepherd. And Father, people that need a new touch from you, people that need restoration, other souls, right, their mind, their will, their imagination, their emotion. Father, we just thank you right now that, that things have become heavy. Things have become a burden many times in their life. And, and so we know that there, there has to be some things on the path that we're not doing. So, Father, I'm asking you right now, again, reach down from heaven. Put your arms around each one of us. 
anyone who is standing right now, whether on site or online, if you're online, stand up right where you are and honor God. Allow God to touch you right where you are right now. Father, I ask you right now, if you would just envelop us right now in your love. Envelop us in your power. Envelop us in your presence. Envelop us in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, even right now. Father, do a work of restoration. Only and it is only the work that you can do. Nobody else can do this. There was no 12-step, three-step. There is nothing for this except your presence. There is nothing for this except your path. This is only work that you can do. And Father, we desperately need that tonight. We desperately need a fresh touch from you. Restore, 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 restore our soul. Let us know that you're right there helping us, leading us, guiding us, providing. For let us know we desperately need that touch from you. Lord, we say again, we declare of our mind, you are my shepherd. Go ahead and say, you are my shepherd. You are my shepherd. Lord, you are my shepherd. Lord, tell them again, Lord, you are my shepherd, and I shall not want. Tell them again, Lord, you are my shepherd, and I shall not want. Father, people have said that you are working your people right now. And I'm going to ask you right now, just receive that right now in the name of Jesus. Just love God.
download the Point of Light Church app. All you do, grab an envelope and give that or give old school like that. Praise the Lord if you want to. Does anybody need an envelope? If you need an envelope, praise God. We need an envelope right over here. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. We're about to be. We're about to be this list. As I, I'm not trying to scare anybody or anything like that. Never let us leave your presence. You are the eternal now. 